We're going to go ahead and get started here. We are very excited to kick off International Co Coaching Week on this Wednesday, uh, May the 10th, to explore your potential. And I'm going to be your host today. My name is Aurora Geis, and I'm currently acting as the president for ICF San Antonio's chapter. And for those of you who already know, International Coaching Week is a week-long global celebration the week of May 8th through the 14th of 2023. And its purpose is to educate the public about the value of working with a professional coach. Many of you here are professional coaches that work in your organizations or work in your own businesses. And we just wanna be able to acknowledge the results, the progress that's been made in all of our coaching endeavors. So during the week, we today, for example, we're inviting individuals to from around the world, but in this case, around Texas, and of course, the United States to explore our potential as coaches and as leaders. And also we want to mention that many of the chapters, if you're not uh, involved with an, with an ICF chapter, you can go to icfcoachingfederation.com uh, and you can find a chapter that you can join because there are many activities associated with each chapter, such as pro bono services in their local communities. So as we get started, this is a quick bird's eye view of all of the uh, speakers that we have for this week. And this has been a collaboration amongst the ICF Texas chapters. So I want to give great thanks to our presidents in Houston, uh, Robin Christensen, and in Dallas, Stacy Witten, in Austin, uh, Tracy Winters, and, and myself, as we have developed the curriculum together. And this is really the first time we've done that. So look forward to even more collaboration with all of our chapters. Um, it is important that you understand we are recording and we have a lot of events. We will be posting this on our YouTube channel. So if you want to go back and review it, uh, feel free to do so. If you have any questions about the recording, you can send an email to contact at icfsa.org. Okay. And just like many of the chapters, we have peer coaching. You're interested in receiving any kind of peer coaching, just go to our site. Find a coach that has indicated that they're uh, signed up for peer coaching, and we'd be happy to connect you with them. And also, we have branded series. Go to our website, see the events that we have posted for uh, this month. And finally, for this week, there is one highlight for the San Antonio chapter that we're focused on, and that is an in-person social. That is tomorrow. And then we have a pro bono coaching event, and that's in partnership with I Empower. They're a national women's leadership group, and we're very grateful for their partnership. We're going to be providing group and team coaching, Jennifer. Super excited about that opportunity. And last but not least, of course, technology. If you do not have the mobile app for Wild Apricot, we ask you to download it on your phone because it's easy to keep track of all your events and also sign up for events. It's easy, easy, easy user experience uh, once you have that, that uh, app on your phone. And again, don't miss an event. Go to our YouTube channel or Vimeo channel to view the events that we have. It's at ICF sa.org uh, or the hashtag ICFSA, and you'll find the videos on YouTube Vimeo that are out there for you to enjoy. We're on every social media platform, so don't forget to follow us. And finally, the moment has come, and that is we are so delighted to have Jennifer uh, Brighton with us today because she is an author. She is a leader in team and group coaching, and we have the benefit of hearing from her about the best practices, but more importantly, she is going to give us opportunities to experience the team and group coaching. So with that said, I'm going to turn it over to our speaker today, Jennifer. Thank you, Aurora. And before we go into the Zoom room, just want to say hello. This is an opportunity in our gallery view just to show your face if you'd like to say hi and connect personally with your colleagues. I know in the Zoom world today, you know, sometimes it's easier to just stay off camera, but we're going to be building on to ourselves. And I want to say thank you for having me. I'm really excited 
coming into you today from north of Toronto, Canada. And I've had the privilege for the last many, many years. So uh, since 2006, actually, to train group and team coaches. So I wrote the world's first book on group coaching. It was published in 2009. It's a little blue book that you can see here, up here on the corner, called Effective Group Coaching. It was published through John Wiley and Sons. And that was my first of seven books. Little did I know how a book could travel so far and be so relevant, not only in the first few years of publication, but even 13 years later. And, you know, coaching many, as I like to term it, my second book was called From One to Many, Best Practices for Group and Team Coaching. It came out 10 years ago. And at that time, myself, along with others, really believed that team coaching was on the horizon. And here we are 10 years later after the publication of From One to Many, and we are really seeing that team coaching, along with group coaching, has really exploded. Uh, today, we're going to be looking at not only how coaches can benefit, but also how organizations can benefit from these sibling subdisciplines of our coaching profession. So I'm coming to you today with a couple of hats on. One as a researcher, two as a coach trainer, also as a coaching supervisor for those that work with group and teams. And most importantly, as you heard from Aurora, we're going to do a micro group coaching exploration in our last 30 minutes together. So I hope that you can stay with us. We're here for a 90 minute call. A little bit about our landscape. We'll come to you in a minute because I want to bring your voices in, right? Part of group coaching and activating a group or a team is your involvement. As a speaker, it's easy for me just to talk at you. But as a group coach, I want to talk with you. I want to co-create together. So we'll be more formally co-creating in about an hour's time. But for now, I'd love to just use this quick exercise I did a lot during the last three years. I like to call it What's Outside Your Window. And in 2017, I released my third book. It was called Effective Virtual Conversations. Did not know how popular effective virtual conversations would become in 2020. And I've always worked in this space, of uh, virtual remote hybrid, not only as a coach. I opened the doors here at Potentials Realized in April of 2004. But that built upon a 15 year career that I had in the global sector. So actually, I spent a lot of the 90s up to 2004, April Fool's Day, working and living out of the Americas, out of Central America, spent six years in a country called Guyana and South America. My husband is from there. And then we had uh, three years where I worked and he worked out of Barbados, where actually my mother in law and sister in law live. At that time, I worked for the United Nations in post disaster management. And I was their sub-regional manager. So while we were maybe a couple hundred miles apart from each other and these different islands dotting the Eastern Caribbean, our realities were incredibly different. And so I know today we've got you coming in from lots of different spaces. What I'd love to do is just invite you to share one thing of what you notice outside your window. Hopefully you can peek out a window wherever you are. If you can't, you can imagine what's outside of that wall. Uh, or what's outside of that room, share one thing. And, you know, I'll just verbally, and I'll get you to do that in chat, um, but verbally, I'll just share a little bit, you know, it's it's early spring, although it should be late spring here in Toronto, Canada. We are above or close to the 45th parallel. And so it's been an interesting spring. We've come out of our darkest winter in 75 years of recorded history. And uh, today is beautiful, but we had snow. Uh, just about a week ago. So, you know, that is the, the changing world of Canada for you. We don't live in ice, you know, ice castles or igloos. I like to always debunk that myth, but our weather is very changeable. So what's outside my window right now are actually a bunch of birds playing because they're loving the sun and just enjoying some warm air. So let's see what is outside your windows. I'm going to go to chat and I'll invite you uh, also, Maria, she's got the bird's eye view of birds. They're loving spring in Austin. Shauna's got a large oak tree. Elena's got gray skies and a water tower in the distance. And Christine sees a sky that is gray. Have a beautiful courtyard with lots of children's toys. Nice. And then I think Aurora is the San Antonio chapter. Nature with raindrops that have landed on the leaves on the trees. The raindrops are perched on the leaves, awaiting to be absorbed and provide growth. 
how lovely, how lovely to be aligned with as well this week's potential, uh, focus on potential. And Sherry indicates privilege includes so, so much assumed that it is not almost ever the reality for those without it. Yes, also sky views of green. And so again, part of group coaching is about finding common ground, even if we're coming from very different spaces and places and experiences. There's a sacredness, I believe, in our work as group coaches in helping people find that connectivity. And we're going to be doing that in about an hour's time. So I hope you can stay on with us. This is a, an interesting sort of like melange. It's a bit, a bit of a mixture of um, different components. And we want to look at several different areas of this burgeoning related field of team coaching. I'll define what that is in just a minute, as well as group coaching. And we're going to look at it through the lens today of both the organizational lens. I know we've got a couple of you on the call that are working internally. You may wear a hat with HR or talent or OD, or maybe you're a leader. Certainly, I came to coaching when I was a leader. I actually turned to coaching, started hearing about it in the year 2000 when I was leading these teams for the United Nations. And so our teams were very multinational, um, 30 people, 26 nationalities, 26 different technical areas. And it was really critical for us as a team across these 10 countries to really tap in and, and harness what we, I would say now as a group coach, our collective wisdom, right? We had experts in GIS and physiotherapy. We had experts in civil engineering and electrical engineering. I supported people who were educators and curriculum designers. And I knew that across these 10 countries, we had 30 individuals from the 30 nationalities that really could change the course of the places that they were serving. Some were national, some were international staff. And so really big focus for me as I found myself starting to hear about coaching was really, how do I help people realize their potential? And as you can see, my company's name is Potentials Realized. And that, is, that has been a big piece of what I've been doing, not only as a coach, but in my former world of work, which actually involved a lot of facilitation. So I would, my bosses would, you know, tap me because they'd be like, Jennifer, you're so great at the community level. We know that that's where you started. Can you go and work with this community or this government to help them articulate their vision and their strategic plan? So when I fell into coaching, I had the leadership background, I had the facilitation background. And as I started my training as a coach with Coaches Training Institute, CTI, back in 2002, my first question as a young student was, this is great, but I don't see that I'm going to just sit down one-on-one -on -one with people. I don't have that luxury. I'm working with communities. I'm working with groups. I'm, I'm, next week, I'm going to be in and working with this department in a, in a, in a government you know, entity. How do we bring coaching, which to me is really about deeper layers of conversation and deeper layers of inquiry. But my question to my coach trainers was, how do we take this into groups and teams where I really feel that to really affect significant large scale change, we need to harness the capabilities of all of us. And so that's the philosophical orientation I'm coming with today, because here we are 2023. There is now an advanced certification in team coaching. ICF launched the pilot last year. They've spent a lot of time over the last three years identifying and then looking at what are the competencies required for team coaches. Personally, I straddle the realm of working with groups and we'll look at what's the difference between group and team coaching. Um, but I do some days like today, I've been with groups. Tomorrow, I'm gonna be with teams. And so, Many of us are working across these related sibling disciplines, as I'd like to describe in my writing. Today, uh, on request, we're going to dive a little deeper into the requirements for team coaches with this new credential, the advanced certification in team coaching. And I think it's useful if you are sitting in a decision maker's um, seat to understand what is the additional training a team coach will have gone through, what are the additional pieces of content and you know um, supervision elements that a team coach who is certified will bring to you and your organization. Now coaching is about action. It's about being in dialogue. So uh, in our last half an hour, we're going to get into a demonstration around group coaching. 
Um, we aren't a team, so it's really hard for me to, you know, bring a team to our conversation today. But we are going to get into thinking about the bridge. What is the bridge for you in your work? Whether the bridge is from one-on-one -on -one to groups, or the bridge might be from one-on-one -on -one to teams, or it might be something completely different. But I want to bring forward a couple of resources I tend to bring in to incorporate uh, in our group coaching work to really activate new insights and actions. Because coaching is not only about action, it's about digging into awareness. So what I'd love to do is find out from you, you know, what are you doing? We are at a space and a place, really, when I wrote from one to many 10 years ago, people are like, you could coach teams. Yes, you can coach teams. So I'd love to hear from you in chat. Um, what's your level of focus? Are you, are you a group coach? Are you a team coach? Are you new to this? Are you experienced? We're not going to do a poll, but I would love for you to share in chat, what is your base that you're bringing? And hopefully we can be building on to that as we go. So just take a moment, share in chat what is on the go. Um, I think it was a few weeks ago, right, Aurora, that I sat down with you and we had an ICF San Antonio session on some of the influences we're seeing right now with team coaching. If you weren't on that call, I just want to spotlight this. And there was a much longer article that came out three months ago in Choice Magazine, which is an amazing uh, journal. In fact, this latest spring yes. series is all about mentor coaching and supervision, which I think is really relevant. But the winter edition was about group and team coaching. So you can find them at choice-online.com. But just to level set, as we get into today's call, let's think about some of the things that are really um, creating a, a condition for great work. And before we do that, I'm going to just go to our room and who's in the room. So I'm going to read this out. So we've got Marcia, who's a team coach practitioner certification from the GTCI with Peter Hawkins, a good colleague of mine. We've got Dan, who coaches teams, five to seven people for some of my Chick-fil-A restaurants that I work with. Excellent. We've got Maria, does one-on-one -on -one executive and leadership coaching, but also runs some coaching circles for cohorts of three to six leaders. Excellent. So we've got a lot of experience, groups, teams, and then this midpoint sometimes where it's working with leaders who are team leaders, but they're coming together to share experience. Shauna notes that she's done a lot of group or team facilitation, but new to group and team coaching. So we'll talk a little bit of some of that nuance, like what makes group coaching or team coaching different than a facilitated approach. Elena is saying new to formal coaching, HR professional for over 25 years, consulting, advising employees, managers, and leaders. Well, welcome to you, Elena. And again, as we go, feel free to ask questions. Um, I'll be pausing regularly to see from Aurora if there's anything in the space. I think Aurora's added she does one-on-one, -on -one, group and team coaching, coach mentoring, coaching supervision. Sounds very similar to what I do in a given week. Sherry notes that she primarily, her group work has been with various owners and founders. So much of the responsibility and all of it for budget generation for their company. Yes. Christine is noting she's a new coach looking to get into groups. Zachary is about working with individuals and organizations. Deirdre is new to group and team coaching. And Hideo, Hideo is looking and works at a multinational company, has a certificate also with GTCI for team coaching foundations. Excellent. You know, what I think is great right now is there are so many different options. When I first looked at, okay, how do I, not only as a researcher and a practitioner, but how can I learn from others? Years ago, there was only Coaches Training Institute, and out of that came this offshoot of the Team Diagnostic Survey with Team Coaching International. I always love to point to the work of Phil Sondahl, who left us a couple of years ago, but Phil wrote a book a few years ago called Unleashing Teams. And I have to say that my work with Phil back in 2005, six, he was actually one of my original coach trainers in a one-on-one -on -one back in 2003 and um, when he was with CTI. But I, I share that because if we look at all of the different um, sort of channels that have come together to this moment in time in a very collaborative space, I sit on a, a global thought leader panel. So we've got Peter and David, obviously well known for their work with the global the GTCI, as I like to say it, I always mix up the acronym. We've got people from Team Coaching International. 
I always love to give a shout out to ORSC, Organization and Relationship Systems Coaching. And there's so many more models. Really, I think all of these models are really important. I like to call myself probably the model agnostic because I think with the work that I continue to do globally, which is often virtual and hybrid, different teams need different things to help them navigate many of these elements. So these influences, which you've probably been reading, things like paradigm shifts, a real requirement for systems approaches, especially if we're working in a hybrid space, recognizing that our spaces and places may be different, a huge need for belonging, right? There has been such uh, an impact of these, these last th three years, two, three years, when the world really changed and pivoted. And so how are we uh, positioning group and team coaching as a space for people to come together, to share experiences, to collaboratively create new pathways, which may involve change, may involve innovation, may involve some critical work as well on many, many different areas. Another factor, which is still playing out probably even more than I when I wrote this article back in the fall of 2022, is this notion of teaming. And teaming is a term, of course, from Amy Edmonston's work. Amy is well known for her work and research in psychological safety, but she put out a wonderful first of many books on the concept of teaming about a decade ago, just a little bit before my book came out. And if you were in that last presentation, you might have heard, um, I went to lunch one day with my executive editor, editor at Wiley, and uh, he, he always came with a book. And he came out with a book just as I was writing from one to many. He said, Jennifer, I want to introduce you to Amy Edmonston. Here's her book. <laughs> and since that time, I've been able to meet with Amy, just wonderful. But, you know, the notion of what happens with teams and how we need to support teams and really look at from a coaching lens, I would say, how do we help teams naturally create these moments and these practices of being able to regularly um, think about how they want to operate. What is their choice point about how they want to operate? One of the things that has happened with the teaming environment is, you know, we have these teams forming and disbanding rapidly. Um, that, in fact, and why I was so intrigued with Amy's research was because my first years as a leader were in these arenas of extreme teaming, as she calls it now. And I would lead teams that would only be in existence from anywhere from three months to 36 months, three years. So a lot can happen, but a lot can happen when teams are able to come together and build those results and those relationships. And I think that's a passion point. You'll probably hear even today, 30 years later, in my work as a team coach and team coach trainer. There are so many adaptive and emerging models that are uh, coming forward. You know, again, if you look at the writing of David Clutterbuck, um, I did a TED talk in December, early December, called Coaching Teams Through Chaos, which takes you a little bit further into what I've been talking about for the last five years of this notion of the triad of trust, safety, and connection. And certainly in the work that I do as a group and team coach, if we haven't spent time making sure that people are connected, that they know each other, that they trust each other, then it's very hard to have a coaching conversation. We can have a conversation, but is it at that depth of where coaching takes us into mindset and assumptions, beliefs and values? With all that is on the go, and I recognize, you know, the discourse is very different for you in the US than it is for us in Canada, especially at this moment. And it's critical, regardless of where we are in the world, do we have that level of trust to really enter into the dialogue that is important for the moment? So think about these influences. I'd love to just hear from you again, want to invite you in um, with your work and your context of work right now, the teams or even groups that you support or the workplaces you're supporting. Oh, and I apologize. We've got, we've got an Amber Alert. I don't know if you have those there, but when someone is, yep, yeah, when someone is in trouble, we've got an Amber Alert. So um, please put for us in chat what, um, which one of these is impacting your work right now. And it could be on an individual level. It could be on a group level or it could be on a team level. I'd just be interested to see which ones are sort of in the space today. And again, we'll be using chat quite a bit. Kelly's noticing that she is 
And this is sort of an add-on, almost done with her IPEX certification, excellent leadership training at Microsoft, looking to work with executives, team, one-on-one, -on -one and relationships. And so as we segue into, you know, some of the areas, Dan, who works, I think, with teams, noting that teaming, trust, connections, and paradigm shifts are really relevant. Yes. Um, Aurora, systems approaches, adaptive and emerging models. Hideo, adaptive. Elena, teaming, trust, connections, and belonging. Yes. So again, like these are just part of the, it's part of a system in which we're coaching. And there may be other elements as well. So today we're gonna to talk really about how do we differentiate group versus team? Because there is a different stance for the group coach versus the team coach. We're gonna get into some best practices and a couple of implementation tips. And we're not gonna do anything about the word out, but we are gonna do a piece around demo. So I'm gonna jump through these slides, but I wanna level set back to our core coaching competencies to really help us identify when are we coaching and when might we just be facilitating. And this is a very old slide, as you can tell from the graphic. I first introduced this at an ICF Converge conference in 2009 in Orlando. So it's interesting that they're back in Orlando this year. And at that time, I was able to do a presentation to about 300 coaches on group coaching. And coaches in those days would be like, really, you can bring people together? Now it's like, of course, you want to bring people together. But, you know, I think there's always been this notion of, well, how do I know if I'm coaching versus facilitating or even training? And so I like to take us back to some of these core elements of our core coaching competencies, whether we're using the old 11 core competency framework or our new one at any core of conversation, one-on-one, -on -one, group or team, we're tending to work around these four elements. So litmus test it to tell, help you identify, am I coaching right now? Am I training? Am I facilitating? You are more likely to be coaching if you're helping that entity you're working with, one-on-one, -on -one, group, or team, if you're supporting them in their goal process, whether it's high-level goals, personal goals, professional goals, you know, the landscape of the coach typically, but not always, has a strong focus on that individual accountability. The client is in the driver's seat. They're setting the agenda. We're typically working around the goals and the things that are important to them. That is slightly different than a facilitator's role. And keep in mind, I came to coaching after being a critical education and process facilitator for about 15 years. So I used to pre, pre like my former world of work, I was flown around the world or I'd go into communities that would take days, literally days to get to, to help them articulate their plans. What was their vision? What was, what was it that they wanted to create? And what was different as a facilitator than my role as a coach was that at the end of that conversation, I could leave. That was it. There was no focus or very little focus on accountability. Also, we weren't getting to the depths of conversation that I get to as a coach. And I said earlier, you know, the landscape of the world of the coach is about belief systems, assumptions, mindsets, all of these, plus other things like values and vision. These are areas in today's world which take time. We need to have that trust in order to dive deeply into those waters. A real definer of the world of the coach is that it's not a one-off, right? It's not a I'm in and I'm out or a one and done. And if you look at the new team coaching competencies, you'll have the wonderful um, continuum. In, in my writing, again, I've been using this notion of a continuum for years, but ICF has done a really good job in the new team coaching competencies to spell out the differences between team facilitation, team training, team consulting, team coaching. And this whole notion of goals and accountability are really key as are the layers of awareness. To what level are we taking the conversation? And what is the role of action? So I like to encourage in, in our training at Group Coaching Essentials, we talk a lot about where are you on a one to 10 in each of these areas? As you are in dialogue, not initiate the dialogue, but as you focus on all parts of the coaching arc, how much a time and attention are you focusing on these four areas? And are you becoming biased in any one of the four, 
right? I think as coaches in our evolution, it's very easy to fall sort of into our ruts. Maybe you're a productivity coach and I do a lot of work with productivity and always have, but it's easy for me to say, what are you getting done? But my role as a coach is really to slam on the brakes sometime and help people identify, ooh, what's the cost? Or what's the opportunity lost when you're running so fast? Really, my role as a coach is to get out of the rut of action and to slow it down so that we can be focusing on awareness. So regardless of if you're a seasoned coach, a new coach, I think all of us are continuing to grow. Hopefully all of us are continuing to grow. And so my invite to you right now is share with us, and we'll use annotation this time. We're not going to go to chat, but we're going to use annotation, which I think is active. Um, you're going to see annotation at the top of your screen where you would see your viewing Jennifer Britton's screen. Move your mouse to the right and click on it. You'll probably see view options. And as you see view options, click again and you'll see annotate. As you click on annotate, you're going to get a whole toolbar up there. So I'm just looking to see a thumb up. Uh, Aurora, you might see it because you're a co-host with me. Is annotation available? Yes, perfect, it is. So here's what I want you to do. As you think about your continued evolution as a coach and you know, the next few weeks, next few months, what is the one area that you want to put more attention around? Is it goals? Is it working with clients around accountability and all the different ways we can do that? Is it about action? Or is it about developing more practices and techniques? for working with clients around awareness. I'd be interested, you know, again, we're gonna see where you decide to stamp. You're gonna notice people are using the stamp function, which is typically five in. And I've loved asking this question for a long time. Similar to our group, people are all over the map, right? I don't think there's one specific answer, but notice for this group, a lot of interest and action around accountability, lesser around goal setting a lot around action and some around awareness. So hopefully out of our, our presentation today and even the micro demo that we're gonna be doing in a short while, that that is um, gonna give some value, some ideas, some different ideas, or maybe a reinforcement on what we can do. So I'm gonna uh, not stop my share, but I'm gonna go back in. I'm gonna clear the screen so we can keep moving on because our annotation will take come with us into the next screen. So just to contextualize, you know, there's a lot of different definitions out there. Um, I, I always go back to the ICF, right? Because we want to make sure that we are coaching. Group coaching from an ICF perspective to include it in credentialing needs to include 15 people or less. Okay, one five, not five zero, not 500, but 15 people or less. If you are going to be uh, counting any larger groups, for credentialing purposes, what ICF is now saying is similar to team coaching, you need to be working with a co-coach. And that's a whole other um, layer of this work. I've been writing and, and researching co-coaching for many, many years. It's an art form, right? It really is an art form. But what makes group coaching different is it's a different stance than as a team coach, right? As a group coach, we're typically the hub bringing people together, whether they're coming from different parts of an organization and working on becoming a better leader, or maybe you're working with entrepreneurs and bringing people together at a similar stage of business or people come together due to shared interest in industry-wide events. Group coaching tends to, but is not always, but tends to bring people together around common interest. And many times the hub is the coach. You are the reason why the group is coming together. You are co-creating with them, right? So it's not that you come with a set curriculum, you're co-creating with them, but also usually, but not always, the, the group disbands when the work is done, when the coaching work is done. So you might be together weekly for, you know, six weeks. You might be together bi-weekly for um, six months. You might be meeting monthly for eight months, right? There's not really a lot in today's world where it's like group coaching has to be this model or that model. There's lots of different models. What is key and integral is who is your client and what's going to benefit them. Just before this call, I got off a call from an organization that was reaching out to me. And while they'd been doing group coaching, it wasn't necessarily as successful as they would have liked. So I found myself asking questions like, what's your group size? 
what brought people together? Like, what's that common interest? Are you taking time to meet with people one-on-one -on -one to hear what their interests are? Is there any peer work within the group? And as you can imagine, the answer each time was no, but oh, that's a great question. No, we don't do any peer work. No, we don't meet with the group members one-on-one. -on -one. Well, back to trust, safety, and connection. If we don't have that trust, safety, and connection, not only with the coach, but across the web of the relationships, this group is really not gonna get activated. And so that takes time, um, whether you're in person, whether you're virtual, whether you're hybrid even. And I think what is important for the work of the group coach is really that ongoing dialogue. So as we get into our demo today, we're gonna be doing more group coaching. We'll find something of common to talk about, but I, br I brought a technique using some visuals that I hope that you'll find useful which can help groups start to lean in together to get to know each other a little bit better so that they are able to enter into the deeper waters of coaching. So what makes group coaching different from teams is that it's not like a team where it, it ends, right? Like a team is always together. So I just wanted to share a couple of examples just to, to sort of context set. Um, many of you, sound, it sounds like you work internally in organizations or maybe a coach that comes in to work with organizations. We continue to see that one of the sort of the most, I wouldn't call it the easiest, but one of the most common entry points for group coaching in organizations is often with new leaders, right? Bringing together new leaders, whether it's part of a formal learning initiative like a leadership academy or whether you are a coach and you may just be bringing people together on a regular basis to explore their opportunities, their challenges, their strengths, their vision. Again, we wanna co-create this. And I think what we're seeing in 2023 is that for group coaching to really work, we wanna make sure that it's linking in to other initiatives in the organization. So, you know, while we're not expected to be an expert, it can be value add to the people we serve, the organizations that we serve, to help them think through how do these conversations, which remain confidential, right? But how does this type of work feed into the larger work of an organization that is continuing to grow? And I think that's very much imperative in a, a, a moment in time where there are economic pressures, there's global pressures. So how do we become, you know, uh, an additional trusted partner to help organizations think through how either a coaching culture is developed or how that coaching culture connects with the other cultures in an organization, right? I think gone are the days where coaching can be seen as something as distinct. We need to make sure that it's linking in. That's a very personalized opinion, but as we get into group and team coaching, we're not just coaching. We are also intricately involved in discussions. There's some level of influence around, um, you know, strategy and and learning at a much higher level as well. So I just I plant that. But as the coach, our number one priority always remains to the group, right? And it's a confidential space. And really, it's it's important that if we are getting into these interconnections that we design that in. So one of the things that is quite common and I think best practice very much is how are we designing with sponsors and then also supervisors and hopefully eventually the clients we're serving. But what is that link? How are we helping stimulate conversations with new leaders that go beyond the room, that go beyond the Zoom screen? Because back to accountability and action, we really want to set our clients up for success. And our work is only in one part of the system in which they operate. So are we also building into some of our design work as group coaches, three-way meetings with the supervisor, where the employee or our coachee can be sharing, they can be sharing with their leader what they're doing, what they're learning. And the leader can also be building that habit of regular feedback because as coaches, we're not often in a lot of models seeing our clients in action. Now there are related fields and I would say some of the best training I took over the years as a coach. Uh, one methodology I use is called shadow coaching where in fact I go in and it's an observational coaching methodology where I might spend and I do spend, and it's back on the books again, but I go in and I work with teams in the shadow 
um, seeing them in action. And like the real learning and the real change happens as we step aside and have these real time coaching moments, helping them reflect on what's working, what's not. So again, lots of iterations as we you know, move beyond the virtual space to help new leaders excel. So I hope this has been a, a good example for you. Again, why is group coaching important right now? It helps with implementation. It really fosters that peer learning. In my writing, you know, going back now almost like 14 years, cross-functional fertilization is key. And that's where innovation lives in today's world. So how are we making sure that we're really creating opportunities for people to come together, learn together, be accountable with each other? Because as much as the coach is the hub, we do not need to be the center, right? And I think this is a really important distinction. We are bringing people together. We have a responsibility to do that, but we want to really activate the peer learning. And so with your groups, think about what that might look like. Um, again, collaboration is such a critical skill set in an evolving world. Um, it is something, again, that is going to be as a workspace gets sped up, whether it's due to AI or other things like how do we ensure that we're collaborating? How do we ensure that we're cross pollinating? And one of our biggest gifts as a coach is to create that pause point in a world that is sped up. How are we creating space for people to pause, reflect, to have the dialogue to mine the action and insights that they're going through and make those iterative changes? So these are some of the things that you know, we see from research and case studies. I'd love to hear from you. If you see any other benefits that you see in your work, please feel free to put those in chat. And we might have someone who's just beat us to that. So they, and Marie would say yes. I might add, absolutely, it adds a scalable form of coaching and also has an eye towards sustainability of the coaching practice inside of an organization. Yes, you know, again, having worked for the UN and, and I was part of the team that was working on the originally the MDGs, right? Now they're the SDGs, but originally there were the MDGs in the year 2000. And we used to really think about how do we create environments, learning environments where the learning happens for generations, right? That's sustainability. And very much it's encouraging for me in 2023, my son is just graduating from high school and is following me. I have a master's in environmental studies, got it 30 years ago when climate change was up for debate. It still is today by some, but he's following in my footsteps. And he said, mom, have you ever heard of the, M the SDGs? And I'm like, well, yes, I have son. <laughs> Part of like the, the uh, regional work that went on in the Americas 23 years ago. But I share that because sustainability is key, right? And I do believe still now we want to work ourselves out of a job, right? How do we create those moments of independence for the clients that we're working with? And so our roles may change, right? To the evolution of the coach. Are we also becoming the trusted partner working in different ways? So thank you for those great ideas, Maria. I think that's it. Was there anything else in chat? No. Um, we might also find ourselves, I just want to give a, a non-organizational context of, you know, we might also find ourselves working with different groups, parents, business owners. I do a lot of work with business owners. This is a framework that I've iterated. It's a manuscript in prog progress. So you might see this in a future book, but very much, you know, with business owners and entrepreneurs, it's about activating skills in lots of different areas, not just marketing and productivity, but helping them develop teams, helping them have better conversations, helping business owners also look at some of the foundational work beyond the business acumen that they might bring and looking at themselves in their DNA. So for 15 years, I've run a lot of different iterations with group coaching with business owners. And I think you know it's important for us to think about the variety in our work, because as coaches, we also want to continue arcing onwards. So lots of opportunity, uh, challenges with working with business owners and people who are paying out of their own pocket, obviously, is do I have the time? Is there a business case for me to believe that this is actually going to make a difference? And this is where we've got to go back to things like, well, what are your goals? What's your vision? What would add value for you to take 90 minutes out of your week or your every other week to move your business and your vision forward. And I think when we ask those questions, that's where coaching becomes a heck yes. Like, of course, I'm going to sign up and like, let's, let's create that 
habit of pausing regularly. So it doesn't matter whether we're working in organizations or outside of organizations, coaching is coaching is coaching. And this is where I want to segue a little bit. I know it's a fast segue, but I want to segue a little bit into team coaching, right? And many of you are also, you hold probably an ACTC like I do. Maybe you've gone through uh, GTCI like I have. And very much, it's uh, this is the definition I came up with 10 years ago, right? So it's a sustained series of conversations supported by core coaching skills. As I've said, it's about goals. It's about helping teams deepen their awareness, support their action, and create accountability. Now, the focus of coaching can be a systems approach, but it might also be strengthening individuals in the team, especially if it's a global team or a hybrid team where they're more work groupish than team. Ultimately, team coaching is about what I call the two R's, results and relationships. And if we look at things like, you know, burnout and, and why burnout became such an issue in the pandemic, especially, or in the, year, the last few years of remote work, I know for my research in remote work, a lot of it is because we've put that emphasis on results. We've really not been focusing on the relational web. So as a team coach, it can be very alluring. And the team will often push you to say, we need to just get results. Yes, but we need to get results through people. And so let's make sure that we're spending time really looking at the relational aspect of this work. So whatever coaching methodologies you use, think about what are those tools and practices you have with results and helping teams move into action and get the, you know, get the goals done, but also what are you doing to activate the awareness and the relational web, the mindset, the assumptions that get in the way, the you know ability of people understanding how they have different styles and work and have different preferences in working. And that can really be a, a big distinguishing factor. So I know there's a chat. I'm gonna just go to our chat here. Um, Sherry's going back to entrepreneurs and also, uh, talking for entrepreneurs, legacy and transfer of trust relationships. Yes. And, you know, trust, and I said this in my first TED Talk, which came out in 2010, it's a TED Talk called the Virtual Remote Hybrid Checklist. And I start off by talking about the triad of trust, safety, and connection. And I really saw that in my years of working with these extreme teams. Again, I was based in a capital city in South America. Um, in those days, highly, highly volatile. Uh, Riots could break out at any time, uh, especially during election periods. And I was supporting teams of 12 to 15 people in that country's what was known then as the hinterland. It could take five hours to five days to get to those teams. And I share this because, you know, like what is on the line? Sometimes it is a life or death situation and teams need to operate fluidly. They need to also have this space for, as you can see with the graphic, to have the dialogue so that they can harness the learning. And we only create learning through reflection and then action. And so very much, you know, my work continues to be very grounded in Kolb's methodology of, you know, action learning as well. And looking at how do we create these moments for teams so that they can be at their best, whether it is an emergency whether it's a response to an emergency or it's just your everyday day in the office. I think people wanna have fun, right? Like it, it can't always be serious. And so how do we do that through results and relationships? So why is team coaching, I think, you know, 2023 important? Teams are the engines of growth and there's a lot of pressure economically all over the world. We're all facing different economic um, situations, but teams and business are really the engines of growth. Another key feature that is ongoing is complex change. Uh, for many years, you know, organizations would em employ me as a consultant because I have worked and rebuilt nations, like literally post-disaster. When you have a capital city getting decimated from a volcano or a hurricane, um, that impacts everything from our land records to our prisons our educational system to healthcare. And while many of us are, have now got the skills to think at that layer of complexity, at that layer of the macro, it is, I think, really going to be a key definer in this next phase of working. And team coaching 
really provides us with that space for us to help teams look at change from all of these different levels. It also allows teams to think about the fact that they are the power of many, right? Using my own terminology, it's not just the power of one. We can affect change as one person, but to really affect sustainable change, it's gotta be a collective change. And so how do we harness the power of many? You'll see the colored chairs below and, and that maps into, again, this latest TED talk, uh, which I call Coaching Teams Through Chaos. And one of the things I've been really fascinated by for years is just how do we help individuals in a team context bring their best self to work, especially in times of challenge and speed. And again, in working with so many teams on the other edge of disaster where they were rebuilding countries and nations and communities, I was always amazed by the teams that I supported as a leader. And notice I said teams I supported as a leader, not the teams I led as a leader, I supported. My role really was about helping those team members find their strengths. And that's why I found coaching such an amazing methodology when I fell into it in 2002. I had about two more years working with it as a leader in the UN system until I lost some vision in one of my eyes, which is what brought me back to Canada. And the ability for teams to really see how they can affect change individually, but more importantly, collectively is powerful. And so I think as people, you know, are finding their feeding, or they're finding their feet again in May of 2023, you know, I think people are really open to that notion of like, how do we do our best work? Not how can I do my best work, but how can we do our best work? You know, systems are everywhere and we may be part of multiple systems, whether we're all back in the office, whether we're continuing to be hybrid or just like our federal servants did here in Canada, our public service just negotiated the right to have remote work experiences. They went on strike for three weeks and part of the collective agreement that they've negotiated is the right to work as not in all instances, but work remotely. And that will, that influences the systems in which people are part of. The final piece, and this is a quick segue over into our ACTC, because we now have the advanced credential in team coaching. And that could be a whole other conversation. In fact, that's where Aurora and I sat down in the San Antonio room uh, a couple of weeks ago. So is, is that available to people or how would, how would they be able to access that Aurora? Yes, I'll uh, put the link in the chat. Perfect. So again, that's like a, a 60 minute conversation about the ACTC. I think, you know, in our work, um, want to just quickly go through it. So this has been an evolution for several years. In fact, um, March, early March, 2020, <laughs> March 6th, the week of March 6th, I was supposed to be in Miami. And um, at last minute, the meeting was canceled by ICF because they were going to have many of us flying in internationally to Miami and borders were starting to get closed. And so it's interesting how the pandemic influenced this global dialogue around team coaching three years ago. And I was one of many people who were part of the discourse. ICF has done an amazing job, not only identifying what the advanced certification is, but what do team coaches really require to do their best work? And in sort of synthesizing many years of work, um, you can hear a longer conversation that Aurora and I had, but in about 10 minutes, I wanna sort of just frame out this is uh, ICF's first advanced certification. It will sit on top of your ACC, PCC, MCC. So it's not a replacement. It's really a specialization as they like to call it. It's a specialization to say, hey, I'm a coach and I have specialized skills, practice and training in team coaching methodologies. So notice that it's not just about learning cerebrally. There is a piece around actually doing the work. This is all direct from the ICF website. So you can go to coachingfederation.org. You will see all of this from team coaching. But as I've shared, there's lots of different areas um, and lots of different reasons why team coaches would be activated. Um, one that I haven't touched on most is the second to last bullet, collaborating with teams to support conflict resolution. And I think that's a really important one. There's a lot of conflict it's overt much more in the US than it here is here in Canada where it's very like under the water line but these are the things that are ripping teams apart and so how do we help teams move through that and decide what they want to do with it 
right? Um, sometimes teams need to implode. They need to break apart in order to be successful. And I think that's something that as team coaches, we need to recognize this work can be very heavy. It may not have a rosy outcome, right? Like thinking about our ability, our presence to be able to hold both the positive and the negative of the world, this really shows up in the, the landscape of the team coach. And so it is an ongoing journey. Um, some people have already been doing team coaching and so they've been able to put in their application in order to be eligible for it. And again, applications are now open. You need to have your ACC, PCC, MCC. You can go one of two pathways. You can do all new coach uh, education and team coaching, 60 plus hours. Or if you've done a lot of team coach education already, you can be in a 30 hour pathway for prior learning. At minimum, there needs to be at least five team coaching engagements within the last five years. In the original pilot, it was 10. We needed to have done 10 team coaching engagements in the last five years. They brought it down to five. And there is a minimum of five hours of coaching supervision, although some coaches are doing 10 and they're in the advanced pathway. So I'm gonna just put on mute. Aurora, are you able to do some muting? There we go, perfect. And so the, in addition to doing the work, having the education, there of course is an exam. So there is a team coaching certification exam, scenario-based that you need to receive a certain score on. Um, it tests you on, you know, are you coming from the team coaching stance? Or you may be answering your questions through the light of a consultant or a uh, facilitator. And then the final piece is really looking at coaching supervision. So Maria, yeah, are you going to explain what the coaching supervision includes? Absolutely, I'd be happy to. I'm a coach supervisor for team coaches. Um, I've been doing coaching supervision informally for many years. And until, until last spring, when I actually started a diploma program in coaching supervision, I thought I really knew what supervision was. Even after doing a one-year diploma in it, which was has involved practice, looking at the research, doing more research, like coaching supervision is, it is like the next thing I think in our sphere. Um, as coaches at all stages of our development, of course, we wanna to continue to learn and grow. And so mentor coaching that you've gone through may have involved some element of supervision in the past. Again, ICF is starting to uh, further evolve the role of the mentor coach been a mentor coach for 15 years, you know, still this heavy focus on the development of the coach on a skills basis. Supervision, in contrast, really looks at the development of the coach in multi-layers. So it can be skill development, it can be ethical practice, but also um, ourself. And are we fit to serve? Are we growing ourselves? There's a restorative and developmental function to the coaching relationship. Now, what's different in a coaching supervision uh, space, you can, you can be supervised one-on-one, -on -one, or uh, we at Potentials Realize offer a coaching supervision group, and people learn together, right? Like, I think the most powerful moments for a lot of coachy supervisees is when they can hear, what are other coaches doing? And so, as part of our coaching supervision groups, are on, on a rotational basis and every group is a little different, but usually there's at least one or two coaches who bring a specific case. So some of the work that they're doing with a team. And as you can appreciate, the landscape of team coaching is so complex. Even as seasoned coaches, we may not be seeing everything. We may not be thinking everything through until we start talking about that, until we start sharing it with others. So um, I've had a team coach supervisor for the last few years, even with my expertise, and it's been invaluable because it's when I sit down with her and say, you know, I'm working with this team that is blank and we're looking at that. But as I start talking about it, there's these new things, these new insights that are like, oh my goodness, you know, I hadn't thought that this could be a, a, a possible conflict of interest or this might actually be shutting down, you know, someone in the conversation. So team coaching supervision, just like, supervision for one-on-one -on -one coaches or group coaches really is a pause. It's a space to slow down, to look at what you're doing, 
and to think about the multiple ways you may move forward. So back to potential, it really helps you activate your potential. And if you have been a member of say EMCC, which is the European Mentoring and Coaching Council, they have required that coaches go through uh, supervision at least on a quarterly basis or for every 30 hours of coaching, which is if you're coaching full time, right? If you're doing team coaching, you might be doing 30 hours in a week. So are you building in time to pause and reflect with a trained and qualified supervisor, right? I've always been one for certification, but I think this is especially important with supervision because like coaching, there are competencies, there are frameworks, there are methodologies. And I have to say, even with all my experience in the realm of coaching these 20 years, I, my learning curve with supervision has been like this. There is so much to learn. And so as you go to you know, find a supervisor like you might've done in the past with coaches or mentor coaches, interview them. Do they bring specialization in team coaching? And you know, um, Peter Hawkins, again, has been a leader in team coach supervision. I trained with Peter last year for three days around team coaching supervision. And it's very different to supervise a group or a team coach than a one-on-one -on -one coaching relationship. So uh, happy to talk more on this. We actually have hosted a series of calls. We do uh, bi-weekly community calls at Potentials Realized, and you can just go to my YouTube channel. So look up Effective Group Coach or my name, but especially Effective Group Coach. And under the Effective Group Coach channel, you'll see a playlist for coaching supervision. So as you can hear, I'm really a passionate advocate. I think there's a lot of learning all of us, myself included, have to do. And I think we in North America um, will be able to build on the lessons learned out of the UK and Europe over this last decade. But it's going to be something on the horizon that you're hearing a lot more about. In fact, ICF has just launched a coaching supervision study this month, similar to what they were doing with team coaching three years ago. So if we really look at sort of the advent and the arc of professionalization with team coaching, we might, it's a might, see something similar in three years with supervision. So question, comment, let's see. All right, San Antonio chapter, thank you, Aurora. You've got it. So please take a look at that. Aurora and I sat down um, to talk a little bit more about the different pathways. Again, you can do all course learning or you can do prior credit if you have been working in this space. And my guess is many of you have. You know, we've been training team and group coaches since 2006 through ICF CCE approved programs. Um, we have now 10 courses. You can do anything from a one-off course like our group coaching essentials or team coaching essentials, or you can do the whole pathway where we look at presence and your superpowers. We look at really what is what are the different ways we want to adjust our styles, our strengths, the way we coach with different types of groups, as well as how do you build a team or group coaching business. So scan the QR code. Um, I think what is good for now is we're going to take some questions because I want to close my slides. I'm conscious of time. Let's see if there's any questions on what I've shared so far as I move forward in my skill deck here. Any questions or comments? Go chat a lot of information, rich information, Jennifer, that we you have been sharing uh, with us and particularly the coaches doing team and group coaching. There is so much to learn in that space. You highlighted results and relationship. And so uh, we are looking forward to really experiencing what does that look and feel like? And I know you're going to tee that up here. I am tee that up. So I am gonna, I, I think this is a good segue. I wasn't quite sure what I would do, but I brought, so from a process standpoint, here's what it is. We've got 25 minutes left of our call. We're gonna do a micro micro sort of group coaching component. This is not a pure group coaching component because I just want to level set, right? Coaching is coaching is coaching. We need to first co-create the agreement. That would That could take us 25 minutes in and of itself. So what I'd invite you to do is think about who you are as a coach right now. We're a small group of, uh, we've got about 15 people on the call. And so I, I just want you to approach this next few minutes, uh, which I'll describe what we're gonna do from your perspective, right? 
Um, you are, as Aurora said at the start of the call, welcome to share. You don't have to share, but we might be able to learn something from your sharing. But if you don't feel comfortable, you don't have to share. The beauty of group coaching is we can activate individual awareness and we can activate collective awareness. As I said, a lot of this, to move to the collective awareness, we need to make sure we have that trust, safety, and connection. And we haven't created things like ways of working. We haven't done the baseline that we would need in order to have a group coaching conversation. So we're going to have more of an individual reflection time in a group context, which is another way to coach in a group setting. But, you know, I hope that you're finding, um, and maybe the, the context setting is, think about this week or even today's call as a bit of a bridge, right? And what bridges mean to each one of us is a little bit different. What I wanna share with you is just a, a montage of visuals. Visuals have a very different way of activating awareness. And I'll talk more about the process of visuals after we go through this exercise. But I'd like for you in this moment in time, be here now and really think about what is your bridge? What is your next step? And I want you to zoom into, for yourself, zoom into one of these images. I want you to lean in, perhaps, notice it. And as you lean into the bridge, I want you to grab a pen and a piece of paper, or you can do this on your device, just don't log us out, log back in if you just get disconnected. But I want you to, first of all, look at what is the bridge all about? Okay, that's a very open ended question. But for the next 90 seconds, and I will set my timer, I want you to lean into and notice what the bridge is all about. Again, we're looking at it through the lens of today's conversation is bridging you somewhere. What is the bridge all about? So I'm going to put on my trusty clock for 90 seconds. After 90 seconds, I'll come back and we'll go into another reflective prompt to go a little bit deeper. Sounds good? Any questions, please put them in chat. All right, 90 seconds, pick a bridge. And what is that bridge all about for you right now? Okay, we're gonna go to, we're gonna go to another question and you can stay with your bridge or you can always pick another bridge. My second question to you is what's important about this bridge? What's important? about this bridge and i'll invite you to take some notes for yourself if you would like to share by chat you can you don't have to though we'll have a little bit of verbal dialogue at the end of this so what's important about the bridge is your second line of questioning Always stay with the question. You can always stay with the question if you enjoyed the question. My third question for you is this framing. So bridges take us from where we are now to another spot across the bridge. So I want to ask you, you know, what is significant or what's what do you want to note about where you are now and where that bridge is taking you to? Let's take 90 seconds. And Aurora will pause this again, but take 90 seconds to reflect on where are you now and where do you want to go? Here's one, one final question, which is what's possible? What's possible for you as you cross this bridge? Group coaching takes place. Typically group coaching takes place over a much longer period. 30 minutes really is not enough, but I wanted to see, Aurora, are we able to go to breakout? Because part of activating awareness is not just our inward reflection. Often we uh, discover things when we articulate and have the opportunity to share it. So are, I didn't ask this, but are we able to go to breakout? Is that a Yes, I'm doing that right now. So we're going to go to breakout with one other person. Just we're going to keep this very small and very short.
But I would like to invite you, again, invitation, you don't have to share or not, you can share anything you feel comfortable with. But if you would like, just share with the other person, like what was interesting or important about this? Maybe you wanna pick about the photo you chose. You're gonna have a short amount of time, I'm conscious of our time window. So let's take two minutes each. So four minutes in total, you'll have to talk to what was interesting or important about this exercise. Aurora, is there anything else people need to know? You're gonna bring them back out after four minutes. Nope, I'm broadcasting the message now. What is interesting or important about this exercise? About this exercise. And I'm gonna go join room number two. So we'll see you back in four minutes. Okay. Can you push me back out to room two? Yes. Thank you. Hmm. Try that one more time. I left my partner there. This is interesting. Let's let me. Yeah. All right. Welcome back. Welcome back. So part of group coaching is about the dialogue, right? And we can only do so much inner reflection. Often the learning happens when we get a chance to articulate things. So you don't have to go into details, but who had some new insights because they were able to hear from someone? They were able to hear themselves talk. Yeah. 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 So again, really, you know, in a longer group coaching process, you're hopefully going to have 60 minutes together, maybe even longer. You know, the reality of workspaces and workplaces today I means sometimes it is only 45 minutes, but sometimes we might have 75 minutes or an hour. So what we just did is an activator, right? This is not the only way by any means. This is probably an opener. So Denise, I see your hand yeah. up. Question. Yeah. So one of the things that Sherry and I talked about is how in person, now we've been on Zoom for so long, we are starting to see how in person you learn a thousand more things about that person and about yourself. And there's actually an easier level of acceptance in person than at least with what we were talking about than on a Zoom where only one person can speak. Yes. You really can't answer a lot of your questions. So that again, supporting the group team coaching. Um, yeah. Yeah. And it's interesting, you know, this summer I'll be doing a two day back in person training of coaches in person. I've started getting this question like, how does group coaching differ in person? And so, again, you may find a lot of things easier. I think one element we've lost is the whole somatic or tactical, the, the, the ability to really be kinesthetic. So my invitation to all of you is like, how do you activate people's physical senses? How do you use things like geography or actually getting people to move in a room to access new layers of wisdom and awareness. Yeah. And so group coaching can look like so many different things, right? It, it is really about meeting a group where they're at. It doesn't have to be inside. It can be outside. But what are the areas that people want to learn and grow in? And that's yeah. going to help frame out what you do, whether it's virtual, physical, or other. Denise, yeah. So give an example of how you get people to get off of their seats and move. What are you saying to hardcore executives who oh, yeah. <laughs> are looking at their clock? Of course. Okay. So I've always been known as the person who will get people out of their three-piece suits. That was my that was my MO when I was with the UN. They'd call me and they'd say, Hey, we're sending you a plane ticket. You're you're going, you're leaving Barbados where you are, and we need you in Germany to lead a program for 200 suited people on yeah. Monday. So a lot of this is your presence, one, we've got to be comfortable with it. Two, how are you going to move people into comfort zone and watch their stretch zone? So yeah. Sherry has her hand up. I'm coming to you in a sec, Sherry. But you could be, again, physically moving people. You could have signs in different parts of the room. Ask them to get up, move to the, move to the area. Um, let's say we're working with leaders. Move to the area that is your greatest strength. You might have communication decision-making, uh, you know, team relationships. 
So you can experientialize anything. And again, back to my YouTube channel, there's a lot of different recordings that you'll find around experiential education, because that's where I started years ago. Let's go to Sherry's question or comment. Yeah, sure. um, I was trained in, in part, my most advanced training was with Julio, uh, Julio Olayo for out of Chile, who is now in the States, of course, um, and incorporating somatic coaching, uh, somatic work with any group will get them up and out of their seat. So, uh, and you can incorporate music, um, directionals, um, and he worked exclusively with leaders. And he always took his music more so than his slides or his handwritten notes. The music would get the people moving right away. And he had them meet other people before they sat back down. So that sparks me. That makes me think of Marshall Goldsmith's feed forward methodology. If you've never met Marshall Goldsmith's work, definitely check him out. He has a process called feed forward, which is actually a really great group or large group technique to get people thinking differently about an opportunity or challenge that they're struggling with. So he has an open source library, definitely check out Feed Forward. You know, group collaborative learning, there is so much. And I think this is where you wanna to go to the web and really start doing uh, research. Certainly if you wanna tap into my body of work, groupcoaching.blogspot.com, you'll find a 15 year old blog there the YouTube channel, like there will never be a shortage of stuff that I've talked about. So whether we decide to go visuals, music, movement, how do we shake things up? How do we help people access new layers of learning that they would not do by themselves or with themselves alone? And that's really this moment in time. How do we help people connect and, and learn with and from each other? So I hope that you've been inspired by this. I wanna say thank you to Aurora for having me come and join you for this uh, hour and a half on midweek Wednesday. Um, it would be really valuable to hear from you. Like, what's your biggest takeaway? We really touched on three very distinct areas, right? We talked about what is group and team coaching? What about this ACTC, the new advanced credential? And then in this last 25 minutes, just zoomed into a little bite-sized piece of activating awareness and insight in the group coaching space. So what was your biggest takeaway? It would be really valuable just to hear one or two words. Um, you know, hopefully there's something that you can take forward and put into your work, even if it's in a one-on-one -on -one conversation. You don't always have to do this with a group or a team. So feel free, I'm seeing some people typing away. Um, Aurora, I know you've got some some things to start wrapping up. So we'll look yeah, at so um, uh, Jennifer, one, one of the thing, one of the takeaways for me is the box of the goals, the accountabilities, the results that you had shown previously, and just being aware as coaches, particularly as we're engaging with teams, et cetera, that uh, we can overuse one of those areas. So that was a great highlight uh, to become aware that as coaches, you know, don't stay in one box. Make sure that you're coming in and looking at the entire system. Um, that that was a great takeaway. And then, of course, some other takeaways. Thank you so much, folks. You're putting them in the chat right now. And uh, the simple but very effective application that was demonstrated through the bridge activity, agreed, was incredible. And then the pleasure of collaboration. It's, as you said, uh, Jennifer, it's the conversation. And then thank you, Jennifer. The photo exercise was powerful. Thank you. I'm going to try it with clients. And it reminds me of the power of symbolo symbology archetypes and how they go to deep level in our collective psyche. And then movement to encourage others, the layer of thinking and wisdom in the group. Uh, totally agreed. Well, the last thing that I will mention here is that if you um, have not checked out the chapter's websites, ICF, Houston, Austin, San Antonio, North Texas, please go there. We have several other events that we are planning. And um, Jennifer, if you can just place your email in the chat uh, in order to reach Jennifer, she's she'll place that email in the chat or her website. And last but not least, there is a thank you to our sponsor. We have a sponsor in San Antonio, uh, which is CPS Energy. And we just want to acknowledge them and thank them. Uh, they are the largest municipally owned utility in the United States. They power a lot of energy uh, to uh, Texans, uh, particularly San Antonians. And so we just want to thank them for their leadership, their vision to build leaders. 
and the community. So with that said, we say thank you, Jennifer, for your incredible session. And we look forward to seeing you throughout the West, rest of the week. Take care. Thanks, everyone. Enjoy and have fun using visuals. Thank you, thank you Jennifer. This was really terrific. Yeah, well, thanks for joining us and feeding forward with your people. All yeah. right. <laughs> Take care. Thank you, Aurora, for having me. Be well. Look forward to keeping Bye. in touch. Bye.